Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our latest edition of Win Wednesdays. I am Ruben Mercado. I'm the Assistant Director for the College of Engineering Student Success Center. Um, welcome to what is actually our last Win Wednesday of the semester. So um, excited about having a good crowd for, for this one. Um, as always, just be sure to keep your microphones uh, turned off, muted um, during the course of the presentation. We will have some time at the end for any questions and answers um, that you may have. Um, feel free to have your camera turned on if you would like to and if you feel comfortable doing so and are able to. Um, we encourage that just so it's a little um, in, you know, interactive. Um, our speaker today is Zach Bunock, and he is going to be covering um, things related to the biomedical engineering industry and um, careers, possible careers, and just tips and tricks for students that are interested in that field. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over um, to our speaker, and thank you all so much for being here. Awesome. Thank you, Ruben. So in general, um, we'll be as interactive as we want to here. Um, I, I, that's great. And I'll probably have my screen up some of the time. So um, if anyone wants to talk, um, since we have so many folks, just raise a hand, probably be best. And Ruben, if you see anybody, if you're, if you're available, um, feel free to interrupt me and let me know um, because I won't be seeing the screen some of the time since I'm sharing. Sure, but, I'll keep yeah. an eye on the chat as well. Yeah, perfect. That's what I was going to say. So feel free to use the chat. Feel free to raise your hand and um, we'll uh, get started. So hello, everyone. It's it's. I'm very excited to be here today and screen share with you um, the presentation that I'll put up just to start talking about it, to have something in the background that y'all can look at. But the, um, so myself, I'm a biomedical engineer by degree. I got my degree not here and I got it in Texas A&M and College Station. Um, I went into industry after my degree um, and did a number of roles that we'll talk about today over the last X amount of years, which I won't say until, <laughs> unless you want to do the math, um, but it's been a while now. The um, I am right now actually at your school. I am part of the executive MBA program, which is a really exciting program to be in at uh, UTSA. Can't say enough fun things about it, but um, in fortunate that you have so much expertise that I get to see um, put forward in that program within a lot of your professors in various roles in the in business side. But from the true biomedical side, um, my entire, uh, I'll go through my history of what I've done, but my entire career, I've stayed in the healthcare space one way or another. Um, it's been actually quite challenging at points for me to stay in the healthcare space. I've uh, taken a path that has taken me into a lot of different uh, and other uh, peripheral areas by choice and by just natural demand of what I was best at doing. Um, and in going to that, I'll quickly talk about what I've done because I feel like it helps bring a little bit of clarity for things y'all might want to ask and otherwise what I might know more than others. So um, just a uh, bachelor degree in biomedical engineering, nothing too fancy, but not too shabby. Um, I did a brief stint as a quality engineer, which is what I would call a not hidden job. There are plenty quality engineer jobs available to even, I mean, plenty, it's hard to get jobs still, but you know, you'll see um, jobs that have entry level positions for things like quality engineers um, um, back then and still today. Um, I did that for about a year. I went through both ISO, international ISO and um, FDA audits at a medical device facility in Texas called Argonne Medical. Um, after that, um, I moved back to San Antonio. I wasn't in San Antonio at the time. And here I worked for a firm called Frost and Sull Sullivan as an analyst and consultant, running up their healthcare practice pieces, starting in patient monitoring and imaging, and then starting up my own group in uh, basically telemedicine and remote health, which was one of our large demand areas and built a practice around that there. Um, I then transitioned to work full-time for AT&T um, and manage their healthcare product um, and innovation stuff. Um, they have about, you know, 40, it, it depends on where, which way you cut it, but about 40 to 100 dedicated people at AT&T in the middle management and up positions to do just healthcare. Um, they sell, you know, hundreds, and billion, hundreds of millions up to a billion dollars to healthcare providers and more general services. But what we focused on was all the innovation stuff. 
Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that really means uh, later on, but um, I found it uh, un you know, unknown, of course, from when I was graduating that things like that even existed, but also that now it's becoming more commonplace and things like biomedical engineering or other degrees or other people that take certain degree paths where you really have a very diverse and you're really wanting to, uh, you know, I call it not do a post office job where you're doing the same thing every day. My job has pretty much always been something that was surprising me every day. Um, and today has been no exception. There's, it's been a fun morning so far, but, um, and then after uh, a number of years doing that around seven, um, I started doing my own independent consulting, founded my own little firm. Um, and now I do uh, dedicated projects. Um, so for example, right now, my largest one is a project where I'm working with a large marketing firm out of New York for a large payer um, that you would know they're one of the top three insurers in the country um, to do, it's kind of an outreach program where we're trying to engage certain individuals. You know, it's a, it's a you know, several hundred thousand uh, base of individuals that they have as members and they want to, you know, improve healthcare scores and have various metrics they want to try to improve. And so we're doing that through a form of gamification and engagement and outreach. Um, and I work as um, advice around how to best do that along with technology issues and all sorts of other really fun stuff that you have to mess with with that. So to do these type of things, um, it requires you to continue to learn in the extreme. Um, one good example of that is, you know, I really enjoy at UTSA the expertise that we that we that is possessed here with uh, data and with data security and and you know all those types of wonderful big data and all that stuff. That is something I've had to become an expert of myself, just as necessity to do these roles. Um, everything I did at AT and T involved some significant form of data. You know, transference, and I had to be and pretty much just be the resident expert on data privacy, data security, especially when it comes to healthcare data, because we would be doing it for something non-healthcare related, and then all of a sudden we're trying to do the same thing for something that contains uh, personal health information, and that opens up a whole new slew of things that you have to be aware of, even very very early on in the productization process. So um, it's really a it's been an incredibly uh, fun path to this point, I'm still having lots of fun, but at the same time, it is a sometimes burn the candle on both ends type of path. Um, you know, it, not to say that other paths aren't hard. Um, work almost by its definition tends to be difficult. That's what work is. Um, but this requires a little bit more of, you know, being able to roll with the punches, being really flexible, and of course, really wanting to continue to learn throughout. And so that's gonna be a little bit of the spin that I'll give for what, what these hidden jobs that I'm talking about um, that are very prevalent that you can go do. And I have other classmates and other you know, acquaintances that had similar um, degree paths that took jobs or careers similar to what we'll talk about today. So what am I talking about? Well, I decided to take this approach and really just list out some job titles here. Um, and, in the, and then I only have about five or six more slides and they go into the asterisk titles we have here. And I really mostly or only focus on the roles that I've had um, in some capacity or had a title that was that at some point. Um, as I, it was what I understood. So for example, in, in my undergraduate work, I did undergraduate research. So I, I was, you know, I did a participated and got mentioned on a published paper or two. You know, I was pretty active on that side. And I would advise similar concepts to you guys. You don't have to go do that in, in particular, but if you're curious about doing something, a job, going into graduate school research, going into a, a med school or some other graduate um, program, you know, professional degree program, um, try it out. Um, I can't stress that enough for any of these things. I had a similar thing happen with my quality engineering. Um, I thought I would enjoy it more than I did. Um, and quality engineering is a difficult job. It's one of the most, I mean, there's a reason why there's entry level jobs. It's, it's pretty taxing. Um, and it's nice to have some of the youthful, uh, you know, uh, enthusiasm um, because it is, a, it is a taxing job to have to deal with all the stuff that goes wrong. Um, but nevertheless, my point is 
I tried it out and I didn't like it. Um, and, and realizing that you really don't only know until you really do it and really think about it while you're doing it. Um, you know, and, and so that's most of the reason why I didn't stay at that job very long. I, you know, left of my own accord and went and tried something else. Um, that's true on most of these things. Um, and, and that's something I would offer a little bit. I just have a quick note on it to try to offer up that advice is, you know, so you never know what your job is going to be like until you do it. But also, once you start doing it, it kind of becomes easy to just kind of stay there. Um, I, you know, I stayed places, you know, six, seven years. It wasn't like I just jumped around all the time. But that would be an advice I would, you know, you, you really think about what you want to do. But then a lot of people stop thinking about what they want to do once they start. Um, and then before you know it, it's been eight, 10 years. And you, you're like, well, I didn't really advance like I wanted to. And you, you have to keep thinking about that and, and kind of reassessing yourself. Um, but to this specific thing, some of the more hidden stuff we'll talk about are things like product managers, um, which was my official title at at and most of the time there. Um, also things like being an industry analyst or a consultant. Um, these are things that feel, you know, you get a kind of a, you'll you show you have a couple things show up in your undergrad program. Maybe even some people come and talk about it that are from a big consulting firm. But, you know, it is a legitimate path. It does have very big benefits and some very real detriments to doing it. There's some things that are much harder in that role. Um, and then I, I'll spend some time also talking about innovation and startup. I do a lot of work to that, but I've never actually started up something outside of, you know, my little LLC firm or um, other small projects. Um, mostly what I've done is listen to literally hundreds, if not thousands, of other people pitch to me innovation and startups. Um, at AT&T, I had one or two a week, basically, where someone was coming to AT&T with their healthcare thing that I was in charge of vetting and deciding if we were going to do whatever or anything with them. And most of them were no, um, because that's a lot. <laughs> and um, so I, I have seen that a whole lot right now. I currently work in the VMS program. It's called Venture Mentor Services. It's also out of UT Health and UTSA. Uh, collaborative program where I still do that for startups in the San Antonio area. Super fun, a uh, little volunteer thing I do as I continue doing that. I work with some of the institutions here on projects and things like that, that are around innovation in San Antonio. Um, it's more my focus right now since before I was kind of flying all over the country with at and Now I get to really just focus on San Antonio. Um, there are many valid common jobs and common does not mean worse and it means better or anything. They're just you know, things that you're, by the nature of learning how to be a biomedical engineer, you're going to learn how to do these things because that's more to the core of what being a, an engineer is. You know, you have to do device design. And there is real device, device design engineers, but as you might already assume or know or feel, they're, they're not, it's not all over the place. You know, it's kind of a tight group. And you also have to compete against other engineers. Um, you know, an, an electrical engineer might be incredibly valid for a job that you're competing against, um, or they might learn the healthcare stuff they need to learn through their uh, industry, uh, through their work experience, et cetera. So it is a very, it, I found it to be a very uh, com incredibly competitive field to get into. Uh, but if you do get your foot in the door, um, it can be someplace you can stay and be very, you know, fulfilled for a very long time. Um, you know, it's that kind of field. The ones that are similar, I see a lot of entry level or quality engineer, technical service, device service. Um, technical service engineers are, are, are sales support engineers, super common. To the, and those are, you know, uh, we had a bunch that went out of Houston that did uh, service for cardiac implant devices. So there is a part of the process when they're actually, you know, installing basically the device that you need to provide technical services. And so you have this you're, you're, you're kind of sales, but you're not. You're going around kind of with the salespeople or like a salesperson would do, and you're doing some sort of technical aspect or in some cases providing technical support for someone who's more of a general salesperson during their meetings or during sales pitches or whatever. Um, they vary, but again, it's a, it's a pretty common entry-level job as well um, that could get your foot in the door to do other things you want, or you could, you know, that could be totally what you want to do. Um, there's also something I, I did, there actually is device sales itself. Um, and I know some folks that make much more money than I do. 
um, doing that, especially things that are high value like surgical um, stuff. So an example is someone I knew that worked at Stryker or still does. Um, you know, you can make like with sales quite a bit of money. And if you're a proactive, you know, incredibly uh, talkative person, maybe um, sales might be the way you want to go. But also there are detriments to being in sales too. You're not, you know, it's, you're just selling. That's all you're really doing. And then trying to, you know, find the next sale. I mean, that by its nature, sales is a little like that. But, you know, good salespeople do much more than that. And then finally, I'll hit on device services. I put that in there specifically, and it is very different. Um, for example, you know, uh, GE has a bunch of ultrasound machines they make. Well, when they make and sell them, that's one of the things they make money on. But they also have a multi-million dollar industry. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue plus um, where they do services on those. And so whenever you sell them, you have a ongoing fee that you also charge them for people to service the device. Um, and there is a you know, massive amount of industry and jobs around that aspect as well. That's very, very different than for, and, and they hire engineers to help with that stuff in many, many different roles. Um, and it's again, not going and designing the ultrasound, it's um, assisting and providing support in various ways for existing deployed ultrasound systems. Um, and that continues to become an, a more and more complex and technology intensive industry or, or service to provide. You know, it used to always be just sending folks out to fix it. And now there's incredibly more and more connected devices like an ultra that, you know, you can do remote diagnostics. You can, I mean, there's some where they almost assist during procedures during it. Um, it's a very rich and, and diverse type of uh, a world to be in that is, you know, has lots of money that's made out of it and is becoming only more and more important. So I'll stop there for a second, give people a chance to chime in or, or otherwise say something. Um, excuse me. Sure, go ahead. Um, sorry, I would have said your name, but I didn't want to like accidentally like mess it up or anything like that. No worries. Um, so I noticed at the bottom of your screen, you have this uh, double asterisk that says roles to deep dive slash um, parentheses I have had. Um, are these, amongst the things that are listed here, does that mean like none of them are ones that you've done particularly? Oh, good call. That's just a mistake, which I can fix right now. Um, it's, uh, these all should be double asterisks. Oh, everything. Yeah, so my roles oh. include these five. Thank you for catching that. And the other asterisk is up here, um, which I didn't highlight really well. Really all I'm talking about here are industry jobs. Um, you know, there's there's some overlap, but you know, in, in my program and to this day, for example, because I keep up on their stats, about a third go in out of an undergrad program go into quote unquote industry, about a third go into some form of graduate school and about a third go into professional degrees such as med school or dentistry or even patent law, which I skipped over here, but we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but thank you for that catch. Yeah, the, the titles I've had are these these five and those are the ones we'll focus on today. Oh, okay. but I'm happy to talk about anything. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for that. Any other comments, mistakes on the page? Uh, hello, sir. Um, what would exactly would you say to uh, marketing our biomedical engineering degree once we graduate? How do you know? Usually, we would go to grad school, like you said, or med school. But it seems that there's other paths here on the screen. So, do you mind exactly how do we market that in the job market in order to get our next job or at least our first job? Thank you. Yeah. So. Um... You know, job finding is job finding. And the earlier you are in your career, the more bigger you are than chooser. Um, I'll, I'll get really direct. So I did my first job I found through uh, Texas A&M's, you know, kind of career center resources, similar to this kind of stuff where they were posting a couple um, and it was a, you know, a true engineer, quality engineer, straight up job where I did um, corrective and preventative actions, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, and I did that for about now once, so that was through a more traditional route, right? It was basically a job posting that I applied for and, and, and um, eventually, you know, I applied for, you know, a dozen or two jobs and that's the one I was fortunate enough to get um, my foot in the door. Um, so when I decided to stop that job, 
basically prematurely, it was less than a year. So that's a pretty short stint for your first job and to do it willingly. Um, so the so then I moved to San Antonio because my wife was starting pharmacy school. And um, so, well, wife, almost wife, we got married a year or two into pharmacy school. Um, but uh, so we decided to move back here um, and I had to find another job. So my first job as an industry analyst that I got took about three and a half months to find after I quit, which was stressful. Um, and in fact, I literally applied. So the job stayed up for about two months. I applied for it, didn't get it. Um, then the job was still there a month later, applied again, did a first round interview and then got past it and got past like the second and third and got the job. So that's how job interviewing works in, in, in a real world example that I'll give you. You know, they, it's kind of full of it and it has so much not to do with you. I literally applied for the same job twice and didn't get it one time and got it the other time. And there was never an explanation as to why. Um, but what I do want to share with you that's a little revealing is I took a huge pay cut for that second job. The engineer job was, I'll, let's say this, it was above 50,000. The industry analyst was below 50,000, you know, not, not really close. And so that flexibility of me choosing to go and live in a particular area on a particular life change, I took a hit on my salary and really career pr progression pretty significantly when I did that. Um, and I'm using this kind of as an example of what the realities of, of these, uh, you know, finding a job really is, you know, what is, what means you don't have a lot of choice or agency and you really do have to give up stuff if you want things the earlier you are in your career. And that's kind of what mine is. Now, I spent those six years non-idle at, at that firm and progressed up pretty, pretty well. But, you know, I, I huge setback when it comes to things like salary um, in that transition. And so more specifically to what you're asking, um, I would definitely go out and understand the uh, uh, companies that are out here in uh, San Antonio and um, to help out with that, which might've already been shared. I did a project for economic development folks here in San Antonio, um, which I'll post in the uh, chat for everybody. Um, and so I did an industry mapping of all the companies within uh, San Antonio that are related to the bioscience and healthcare sector. Um, you're more than welcome to go there, check that out as a resource to find, um, you know, places to go look at, because it really is, it's you going out, if you want to find a job at a, at a place, you got to go find those places and do it, it's pretty standard stuff. Um, but I didn't know where to look. I didn't even know there was a, like, I didn't think about being a consultant at all. I didn't think about um, doing anything in the startup really starting off and definitely nothing around marketing, like you said. And it's really a, a finding an area or, or companies, like say you want to stay in San Antonio. Well, that, that'd be a good exercise to go through is really familiarize yourself with uh, companies in the area and um, going to their website, seeing what they're all about. Of course, looking at their career postings, um, looking at institutions that are maybe, or, or other areas that you might find. It's really just difficult, um, significant work um, and, and quite a bit of luck around these things um, to do it. But again, a lot of stuff around it, just hoping that helps a little bit, little all over the place. <laughs> I think specifically in my, relative to my question, I think, how did you, figure out how to pivot is probably my question is, how did you make that successful? Sure, um, so one, it's you a lot. Like a lot of these are self-reflective activities. Um, I'm not sitting here saying, cause it's hard to t dif uh, describe any specific things on how I pivoted as they would apply. Um, I'll give you some, but you know, and I'll, the first and foremost is like, you're always self-reflecting about what you want you know, who you are and what you want kind of questions. And in these, um, that's what I discovered. I discovered I didn't want to design a needle for three months. You know, that, that, that was torture to me. And I didn't really realize that and started doing it. And that understanding I was able to bake into the, the decisions and path I took. Not rocket science stuff, pretty, pretty easy. But again, just that's what the reality of, that's what I did. And um, to make it successful in doing it, it really was a 
you know, uh, finding what you're good at kind of stuff. I found out I was very good at um, kind of doing things that people didn't want to do on some of this stuff. It's really easy to um, be an industry analyst and get very, uh, uh, you know, disgruntled or otherwise, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a crystal ball type of thing. It's nothing like engineering. You're making guesses. You're, you're, you're constantly having to do things that were pretty, pretty difficult and taking, I found that my abilities of patience and things like that with clients were very early on, I, I, I found success in that. Um, and so that, you know, that was a big part of it was how fortunate I was that that fit my natural, um, you know, what, what I'm pretty good at, but what I was okay at was just doing basic engineering and design or coding, for example. I've done some coding exercises where I was not, you know, I was okay at best. Um, and so, of course, going to your strengths is a big thing, but it was more just, I mean, it sounds silly and simple, but it really is this, this constant kind of self-reflection stuff, staying positive and keeping everything kind of in balance. Um, so, uh, again, it, it's a difficult thing to answer, but... Um, you know, pivoting to those other spaces was not, I mean, this is hindsight stuff. I didn't know if it was going to work. And um, some of these, you know, I didn't want to go take a, you know, X amount of pay cut for that first thing. That was a real hard decision to make. But, you know, six years later and working really hard, you know, it, it got to a decent point. And I'm not sure that was the perfect choice either, <laughs> but it worked out okay. In the end. Thank you. That answered my question fully. Okay, sure. And I'm going to blab a bunch. It's been that kind of week. Um, and I think all of this stuff has made it even worse that uh, craving human interaction does uh, make me a little more talkative. Um, any other questions on, on here before I dive into some of these particular um, jobs? Um, I want to see if maybe you could talk a little bit more on like the, um, the marketing slash managing side. I feel like oftentimes when I'm talking about the potential jobs you can do in the industry, they're talking about the common jobs that you listed, mm -hmm. um, but it's not like so much like the actual management stuff. It just says like, oh, like there's a chance that you could get there, but you have to like build up in a career or you have to build up in a company specifically before you can get there. You can't really expect to really get anywhere near that until like much later. Would you say that that's actually true? You know, there's some of that that is true, but, and I'll get to it, it is my next slide. Um, so, but it's not really that true, right? It, I've seen people straight out of college that were a product marketing manager at AT&T, straight out of college, um, trying to think, I think he just had an undergrad and he was a biomedical engineer. And I didn't, I wasn't even involved in the hiring or anything. He came through, you know, an unbiased, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't do it just because of I liked biomedical engineers, someone who had just worked out for it. Um, so it does happen. The problem is that they're hidden and that's what makes it really hard. So product marketing managers or product managers is probably like a hugely common title nowadays, but no one really knows what it is. Um, and y'all are welcome to read the jokes. I won't do it. I'd like, most of them are pretty solid. This one has the concept I'm trying to bring forward pretty well, which is, you know, the product marketing manager is just listed at the end of this list of all these things. And what the product or the product marketing manager does is owns everything. And it's, you know, I, I'm taking a marketing class, for example, and some of you might've taken similar stuff at UT, um, I say, but marketing in general has become this kind of product marketing role where you really own everything. And, and you, so you have a product so you own this one new product from this company, this new drug at, you know, drug or, or lab assay or something. And you're in charge of really everything related to the business of that product. You know, you don't physically go out and sell it, but you might be right in the room with the salespeople. I mean, it is end to end all the way from selling, creating and selling then to delivery and everything else in between. Um, and it is a very uh, diverse and, and interesting role. However, it is usually also an incredibly difficult and bureaucratic role um, and, and does not have a very clear degree plan for who should go into it. Um, it, it so it's, it's one of these things that just organically popped up as a uh, industry role um, for companies, 
but doesn't directly tie to say, for example, getting a degree in product marketing, which I don't think exists really. Um, there's just stuff. So I, I know a lot of biomedical engineers. I know a couple of biomedical engineers in it. I knew people who were engineering of completely different. I knew people who were just business. I knew people who had liberal arts majors um, that all ran this role. And um, it, it really becomes a, a difficult to describe business role. So, um, and that's where they dumped my innovation projects into quite often into this marketing department of product marketing. Um, but it is everything from managing, I mean, it's on the slide here, managing vendors, budgets, marketing materials, the actual like sending out ads or otherwise brochures for your salespeople, full life cycle stuff. And it, so basic business marketing class stuff. Um, but what really is the secret sauce for it is having an incredibly solid foundation of knowledge in whatever you're doing. And biomedical engineering was a wonderful um, path towards that. So if you're, set, you're, you're managing a medical product completely and utterly understanding, you know, kind of this, the engineering uh, concepts, how it works, what it is, you know, is, is directly related to how it provides value and how you sell it. And so that foundation just, just solves all that kind of BS parts in a lot of ways. So it was an excellent way. So having industry expertise or knowledge that you can get um, partially by doing a biomedical engineering degree program is really an interesting uh, uh, leg up I found in doing these. I mean, because most, most of the time you were dealing with product managers who really didn't have as intimate of an understanding of healthcare products that you would have simply because you, for example, know how a pulse oximeter works, like, like fundamentally, or you can figure out pretty easily um, just by looking on, you know, online real quick because you have these fundamental knowledge base things. Um, so I, I, getting in more into the slide here than, than your question, um, but still the finding these can sometimes be as simple again as stumbling across them in your job searching um, but having a little bit now of a kind of perks your ear up that, oh, maybe this is something that does apply to me. Um, maybe maybe it's something that I are, are listening right now. Maybe this is something that interests you or doesn't. Because um, before I just, you know, I go back to my, you know, now 18 years ago or whatever it was, um, more like 16 I didn't know it. I didn't have any idea. Right. And so all I can really offer you without sitting down and talking, rambling for a really long time is this exists. It does. Biomedical engineers have excelled at it. And so have other degree plans as well. Um, it, it requires a lot of flexibility. It is similar. It's like an, to be really good at it. It's kind of like an entry level innovation thing because you got to jump around with all sorts of stuff, but it is very bureaucratic. You are very much in the middle of all of these really difficult balancing act type things where you have to balance this side of it and this side of it. And, you know, you're in between everything all the time. But nevertheless, um, you know, when you would see something like this, if you saw a product manager, I do see entry level jobs around it. Um, they're not, you know, it's not as common as quality engineering or maybe um, some of the service engineering jobs I talked about. But um, after, I mean, you're always dealing with this most simple part to just to put it aside. Everything says you need a couple of years experience. That's the, you know, the bullshit of, of getting out of with no experience. You know, everything always seems to ask for that. And there's no answer I can give you to that. It just sucks. Um, but I would give you advice that, you know, apply anyways. I've seen many, many times where <laughs> they say that, but they still hire someone that maybe didn't have that experience if, if the situation allowed. Um, but beside all that, putting all that aside, that, that incredible challenge of not having experience, but always needing it to get your first job, um, product marketing managers or marketing in general um, can be an entry level thing. Now, if it's just marketing and you're really just kind of like you're, you're a director of marketing in a very small firm or some, I mean, that's true marketing and that does not need as much um, uh, uh, understanding of the product to do it just like true sales in some respects does not really need to know the product you can a good salesman can sell any product a good uh, marketer can market any product um, product managers have to understand their product and therefore things like biomedical engineering provide a massive 
benefit to that. And I will stop oh. and let you comment because I, I rambled for a long time after this question. No, yeah, you're totally fine. So in summary, what you're saying is that what's really important when it comes to product manager is A, knowing that it's available to you so you can apply and test your luck, but also B, um, what really kind of helps you in this is not necessarily so much like um, your degree per se, but just like the knowledge slash skill set that you have that can help you in that particular role to be considered, right? Like if they, for example, see that, okay, um, um, I'm gonna use it, you as an example. Zach has a lot of like knowledge and experience in this field of healthcare. He's been working on this. He's been doing stuff and research and stuff since college. And now he's even had some year of experience in the actual world, be able to help us with this. And that's how he got like a job at at t Though technically speaking, that doesn't make sense initially off the bat, right? Yeah, and and so it was, um, to talk specifically how I got the job at at t So yes, is the first answer. Um, and, and as a follow on, so I worked with AT&T, Verizon, Sprint um, in my role as a consultant. One of the huge advantages of being a consultant or a market analyst is you get un unbelievable amounts of exposure to a lot of other companies and sometimes really, you know, obviously very big companies like AT&T, but, you know, hundreds. Um, now, it's really challenging because you're always the... Uh, uh, you're working for someone else that can just treat you like trash, <laughs> um, you know, all the time, you know, you don't have any leverage, you just have to do whatever they say, and they can be, it can be really hard to jump into just all these different companies all the time and be a consultant for them. And then they're always just like, no, get it done yesterday. So you work long hours, you, you, you have a lot of stress that you probably wouldn't have the same kind, not being consultant, actually working for someone and they owe you a little bit being an employee. Um, but nevertheless, you get exposed. So I was exposed to at and I did big time projects for them. And so they got, you know, basically it's like a mini internship kind of thing, right? I get to work with them. They get to work with me. They get to see how much stuff. It was really a, they reached out to me and said, hey, we need someone. We have a role. Would you like it? So again, just a fortunate thing after six years of working and uh, at the consulting firm. So that's how the product marketing manager role fell into me. They tagged me on with that title where many times I had to do kind of a, well, I'm doing product marketing a little bit, but really I'm doing this stuff. So I split my time to do the innovation work quite a bit. Um, so I, but I still went to, I still had a product I had to manage. I just, you know, it was my side project almost compared to some of the other things. Um, but I did want to share that that is one of the huge advantages to that in the next slides, if we get to them around uh, consulting, you do get huge exposure. People get to see you all the time. If you're working as an engineer, you never get to see another company ever. Maybe your vendors a little, you know, it's a, that's one of the huge advantages to things like being an analyst or being a consultant, super cool. Now, um, and, and so that's what gave me, a, a, really, I had a good picking. This is not the first time it happened for the consulting stuff. That's that's a huge advantage. That's why people don't usually work as an industry analyst or consultant for 10, 20 years. They usually find something and move on. Our av I was pretty long. Our average was probably like three or four years um, in that role before they found something that offered them a better deal. Oh, okay, thank you. Sure. I'm keeping a little bit of a watch on time, but we're okay. Um, so what is a market analyst? Um, it's, it's really pretty basic stuff in some sense, but it's not, um, it took me a long time to realize, or it took, I did not expect it at all to be, it's really not math like math. It's not statistics. It's not engineering. It's more art. Um, so you create market reports that say, okay, uh, ultra, I'll stick with the ultrasound, ultrasound industry, they will. There, people would like to know how much of that is sold, how much revenue it generates in the U.S., you know, what's it going to generate next year. And, and so you try to create a report that says all those things. Um, what, what is making the price go up or down? What things in the industry are happening? Are there some big things we need to worry about with, you know, government regulations, you know, anything. And so we, you know, they, there's these firms like Frost & Sullivan that do um, scheduled reporting of this. Like every two years, they put out a report on this market. 
and then they sell those reports to companies. Um, it's a really interesting and weird world in a lot of ways. Um, most of the information you get is from looking online and public sources, but also from talking and doing interviews with all the industry participants themselves. So they're like paying you for a report that you got a lot of information from them on and, and integrated it all together and made something a little different, but still, you still got most, you know, most of all your real important information by talking to them. So as you might guess, then it's a really interesting world to, to walk in when, and there's a lot of like, you know, behind the curtains kind of stuff to it. I, I, for example, I'm sure you guys have heard of things like JD Power and Associates. They do uh, awards for like cars and you'll see them on commercials and stuff. I can tell you right now, all that stuff has a significant, you know, money exchange involved. They call it licensing or copyright or something, but all those awards can only be used in the commercial if they're paid for to talk about publicly because a, and, and Frost and Sullivan was no different. Um, so it relied on the market analyst to keep the ethical value of that. But as you might guess, there's lots of, you know, bad thing, you know, that, that I should give it to the person that's going to buy it more than the other person that's, uh, you know, maybe deserves it more. So it, I bring it up because it is wonderful. It's, it's like a step near consulting. Um, you, it's an entry level job. I bet Frost and Sullivan, for example, is hiring right now, but at the same time, they, um, it can be incredibly challenging because they, they're not going to pay an engineer level salary starting off probably. And they, you know, you have this very soft world of stuff. It's not like this is regulated or anything. They can, you can kind of do whatever you want. This isn't, you know, there's no quality systems here or engineering audits. Um, it is a business business world and that, you know, has its own forms of challenges to, to work through. All right, any comments? Now, then I will go on. And so here's consulting. We talked about this a lot um, already, so I won't go too much, but you know, there's kind of two kinds of consulting. There's kind of general business consulting um, that, for example, the market, Frost and Sullivan has a market analyst kind of side and then a consultant side. So market analysts do things like scheduled reports or awards or things that are more uh, scheduled in nature where consulting is project-based. Company X comes to them, says, I want you to find out this thing. We'll pay you $100,000. Can you do it? Great. Sign a contract. Three months, you do the work. Um, you can also do things very intensive like that. Like all you do is FDA approvals. And so a company that's small doesn't have their own quality side. They'll go out and hire a consulting firm that does FDA approval for them um, or very specific things like that. So they, there's a huge range of stuff. And right now I do quote unquote consulting um, but I really work as basically an independent. It's just so I'm not an employee on their salary. I, I, I come in and work for what they need at the time. And many times it's just my knowledge or skill set in general around setting up programs and, and running things in specific uh, areas. And then, you know, when, when my time is not needed anymore, whatever that might be, I go to the next thing or stop working for them for a while. Um, it's all of these also have a lot of travel, especially consulting. Um, so again, works better when you're younger, not maybe when you have a family, things like that. So it's not a bad place to be when you're younger. It's very active, but at the same time, it, it'll burn you down. It'll burn the candle at both ends. It's a lot of work if you want to get somewhere with it. Um, and you'll work typically more than 40 hour weeks salary. So I did want to... I'm kind of going a little fast here to get to this slide. Um, so what is innovation work? Um, well, this one's, the, so talking about product marketing is a pretty defined thing, even though we talked about how it's not sometimes, but innovation and startups, this is even more of a difficult area to, to identify specifically what it was. And I would have never, I, they still don't have at AT&T a defined role for this. I was literally just passed around within the organizational structure as they saw fit because I was still needed because there were these very high profile, very significant projects that I was um, running. Um, you know, I, I couldn't be let go. For example, near the end of my uh, tenure at AT&T, 
I had to move back to San Antonio. I lived in Dallas in their headquarters for about three years. And I said, no, I have to move back to San Antonio. We have, I have a personal thing in six months, you know, I will be leaving. And they said, okay, it's great. We're, we still want you, we'll figure it out. And then six months later that came up and they hadn't, you know, fully decided on anything. I said, okay, my house is sold. I will not be here tomorrow. I will not be back in the office. I will be in San Antonio. And then I worked there, you know, another two and a half years, three years. Um, after that, just working remote, despite the fact, and this was pre-COVID and all that stuff, um, despite the fact that, you know, I never had approval of any real kind to do any of that. They just, you know, continued to need me and, and no one was telling anyone to stop. So I continued to work and everyone was fine. Um, but these were super, I mean, this was a very unique and interesting role. I can't uh, point to it being duplicated. What I can point to is aspects of startups, aspects of, you know, so working for small companies is very interesting and, and a valid place to go. But all of these become more intensive around needing an in. All, all job stuff is almost, is very commonly derived by, you know, knowing somebody or having an in into the job. But these are to an extreme. Um, I would have never worked at at and if I wouldn't have been so already intimately involved with their stuff there and the people knew me to the extent they did and knew what I would be doing and knew all this kind of stuff you know that it's not like that job was ever posted um, in any outside of what was required by HR um, and that's many times true also for or or somewhat true for startups you know startups you know they kind of get most of their hiring done either through very random things or the specific, hey, I know this person that I worked with at the lab, I'm starting up you know, from my master's program, you know, I, this is neat thing I wanna start up with this you know, professor, doctor or what have you. And they started up and then, you no, know, I want this engineer to work with me. That it's usually, it's almost always that kind of route um, for things that are innovation or startup and, that I've seen. And so here, this is, this is true extreme networking stuff not as much, um, you know, going out, finding what's out there on various, you know, it's difficult to point to one thing that works better than another on all this stuff. My jobs have come from a completely different way. This last project I'm doing literally came through a message on LinkedIn. I didn't even know that was possible, but um, it was it, it was a complete and valid um, opportunity that I, you know, get, get paid for. So, and I've had some that were typical job things through my university. I've done things through the Frost and Sullivan one was just on, you know, general internet um, type stuff. It wasn't anything special. Um, so there, I can't point to any one thing that's gonna be better or worse for finding jobs, but I can say that um, it's work and um, you just have to kind of self-reflect on what you're doing and, and put the time in and, and you know, Keep, uh, keep your spirits up because it's incredibly depressing no matter what way you go through it. Um, things rarely just fall in your lap. Even the thing with at and didn't fall in my lap. That took six months from the initial offer um, to when I finally was able to leave and join. Um, they had some personnel changes that, you know, bureaucratic kind of BS stuff that had nothing to do with me that, um, you know, prevented it. So it's very difficult six months <laughs> to wait and know that you might have to leave at any time, but, but you don't know if you're gonna leave and you can't say anything about it. Um, you know, those are, those are more the realities of what's going on. But I, got, I digress, I just want to, you know, I can talk about what these things were with innovation. That's in, I think it's really cool stuff. We did things like, um, what's the example here? It's this prosthetics company, um, makes the most below the, above the knee prosthetic legs. Um, they wanted to put in basically an accelerometer with cellular on it to know when the leg was being used because their biggest problem, again, in their service industry, which is actually a majority of their revenue, um, is that people get prosthetic limbs and then they don't use them. And then they don't get reimbursed for that because people have to pass these tests at certain gating points um, to show that they've been using the prosthetic legs. And there's a number of real reasons why they don't do that. But if they had just a little bit more knowledge, if that leg was sitting on a shelf for two weeks or if it was being moved around, um, it would hugely help their um, efforts to help, help their users um, use the legs and figure out what's going wrong and how to help them. Um, and we didn't, you know, that, that came to us. We were really fortunate to work with this great company. 
Um, but that type of innovation work requires a very specific type of uh, approach. Um, for example, typically AT&T would just, you, that would come forward and it would just get drowned in the bureaucracy. Um, we created a separate, what we call foundry. Um, it was in Houston um, and it still is, even though they're shutting it down this year. Um, that we're in the Houston Medical Center where we bring in companies like this one to work with a dedicated, so I hired some, or I was part of hiring some really great biomedical engineers there who worked at this foundry. Um, those were both PhD engineers um, and they sat down and helped design and create prototypes and first level production models um, for, for this type of work. Um, and this, we, we had about five or 10, uh, five or six a year that we got through that are like this, where a company comes to us or we figured out to work with them and we made a new, you know, AT&T and them thing that was, you know, something that's never been done before. Um, but again, I could talk forever on the uh, specifics of what innovation is and how to do it effectively. Um, for this audience, you know, I rambled on what I tried to focus on, which is this is a really cool world to live in. It is very hard to find stability in it and find, you know, e you know, accessible roads into it. Um, it is only for those I would say that are, you know, big into networking, big into, you know, this is the most extreme of who knows what you're going to have every day kind of stuff. Um, and everything else works against you too. You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's fun work that, uh, you know, makes money, but it doesn't make money today, you know, all these type of things. So it's a, uh, it's a very challenging world, but if you're motivated and, and it's something that really appeals to you, it can be a huge, um, you know, intrinsic value. Um, I have a question. It was, are the majority of jobs that are open in companies publicly posted or are they kept within the company before making it public? Um, so for example, would they rather look for potential employees for the new position within their company? Or existing employees? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, what you'll see a lot of is I, I'm, I'm fairly confident, I'm no HR expert, um, but I'm fairly confident that there are requirements for posting. Um, so like at at and you know, even though, um, you know, you would, you would post, you, you know, you, you knew, you could have situation where you knew who was going to be, and it would still be posted, for sure on the internal at and one. Um, if not on a public one as well. So HR policies or otherwise things really do drive a lot of maybe not um, valid postings uh, or things that you know really have a very low chance of having an outside person come in. Um, inside uh, hiring tends to have such a significant advantage um, all around. So that is another part of why ins are such a huge deal, right? Um, it is very difficult to get into a job. And if you do get into a job that was completely outside, um, it's very common, uh, probably would say much more likely common that you're entering into maybe a bad situation um, because there wasn't anybody. Why wasn't they'd have anybody inside that could fit that? Um, you know, maybe they're small, maybe there's, maybe it's just nothing to do with that. But um, my answer would be, yes, they, there's a huge, um, bias for internal hires, um, but that, or some sort of knowing hire, like someone that was an intern or someone that, uh, you know, you knew or otherwise um, had, had worked with or been exposed to, where getting in your foot in the door without those, you know, is real difficult. Um, I, I have seen a lot of plenty smaller mid-sized companies that don't post outside at all. Um, you know, they just, just zero chance. So, um, you know, and that might be because of, a, uh, uh, you know, it's all those are work. <laughs> and so if you can find, you know, it's basically, I see it in San Antonio quite a bit with the innovation institutions or companies or smaller companies, they just ask their network of folks that they work with, you know, people like their, their more direct LinkedIn group, you know, not LinkedIn itself. They don't post it necessarily on there, but that's a good place too. They'll just ask that kind of work group that they have or their executive council of folks and they'll say, hey, do you know anyone who would be a good research scientist for this thing? And that's usually their first, uh, their path of least resistance, where if they find someone through that, they'll just do that and never post it. But with the bigger guys like AT&T, there's some interesting worlds of kind of forced posting that happens that 
may have never had a chance to begin with, which can be very challenging. You know, it, it, it hurts us on our end as appliers because we see these things that maybe aren't valid. And, you know, it's hard to understand which ones, you know, it just limits and lowers your chances of seeing stuff and makes you depressed to apply to so many things and not get any, any response at all. That leads to my next question. Which jobs are the most likely that are actually intend to hire employees? It varies. Again, I think the more, that's more of a, and, it, and it's changed over time as well with the different modules for recruiting and HR, the different ways you did it. Um, you know, LinkedIn is a relatively newer one while well, going on career builder, whatever is relatively old. And so you get kind of a feel for that after applying for as many as people do <laughs> like myself over the years where, you know, understanding which ones are done by uh, hiring organizations, you know, those kind of in-between folks, which, which aren't a real job, right? And you, you'll see those and they become evident pretty quick that they're probably not as legitimate. Um, and so working through all of that is very, very challenging. Um, I, you know, I just know what I've done through my personal experience and, and otherwise, um, the career center and stuff, I'm sure are your, your version of that here is, is probably pretty well versed in that too, <laughs> and how to help y'all with it. But from my side, um, don't get discouraged. There's, it really is a trial and error thing. Um, it, it is difficult to, you know, to, to, to manage that kind of stuff because there are a number that, that, that will be not valid and, um, the more, I mean, I, let me, let me give you this last one and I'll stop. Um, I love that uh, LinkedIn shows how many people applied on those things. I think that's a wonderful, uh, way to understand what those jobs and which ones are more valid. So if you're able to find something that you apply, that you, that seems like it fits for you and not a lot of people applied for it, that's really interesting to me. And those get my attention much more. Um, than the ones that say 200 people applied for, that seems pretty difficult, you know, right? Because it's a lot of people and all that stuff. But I find that they're better when they're more narrow from, from our seat as the applier. And when you see those ones that only had like 15 people, that's something that you're going to have more of a chance of doing. But there might be reasons why it's so low. It might be a bad job. It might be a bad place to work at. Who knows? But I, I find that, you know, some of those newer things like LinkedIn that start giving us a little more information allow us to make better choices around um, dealing with that stuff because it is, I mean, it's crapshoot stuff. It's very challenging. And I know we're getting close on time here. I'm really near the end of it. I talked about quality engineering. It's more of a common job. I won't talk about it too much here. I love the joke, though. Um, so I'll leave this up for the last little bit. Um, and the other area I didn't talk about, which is incredibly valid, but only a couple people usually take the path, patent law, love patent law, really solid. If you can be a lawyer in patent law in a, in a highly specialized field like, um, like uh, healthcare or medical devices, other thing is security law, um, healthcare privacy law, like HIPAA law, super cool too. So those are real. If, if you had any inclinations to become a lawyer and work in security or, or patents, give it some thought. It, you know, I just saw one of my uh, classmates on LinkedIn post. He's working for, you know, one of the biggest scientific research facilities in patent law. Um, super cool. Um, so there, there is other things as well. Dentistry, lots of dent, a uh, couple dentists I know too. So it's not just medical school. There's all sorts of other professional schools. Uh, my wife's a pharmacist. She's not a biomedical engineer. She's a chemistry major, but um, you know, lots of other paths on other things too. Um, not just grad school or med school. There's you know, fun other uh, less uh, trodden paths you could think about. Someone made a comment about the hiring for human resources. Um, I think essentially what her comment was saying, I believe it's she, um, is that like they will release it, kind of like what you were saying, that they release it to the employees first, and then a few days later that they release it publicly. Yeah, yep. And and but that's not always so. It's it's true in big folks, but I don't know. It's not a requirement or otherwise true in the smaller folks. And that's usually like a 
bigger things tend to take the national standard, which is the state that has the most, and thank you for that, um, calling attention to that comment. Um, uh, bigger, bigger. Um, so like at at t we took whatever state had the most stringent process and was and, and, and made it that. So that kind of became the national standard. But for if you're mid-sized or smaller, less than 200 people or less than 20 people, um, you, you don't have the same uh, requirements. And so it kind of becomes a wild, wild west, especially in Texas. Texas has very limited requirements as opposed to like California. But yeah, good chat. Thank you for putting that in everyone. Okay, cool. Uh, we are over time. Is there any, any last things or, you know, I'll spend a minute or two, but I uh, want to be respectful of everyone's time. All righty. Zach, <clears throat> Zach, thank you so much for um, the presentation today and just taking the time to share with our students. Um, is there is there a better way, like if uh, students had follow up questions uh, for them to contact you or do you want them to work through me or how would you prefer? Uh, they can work through whatever the I, I, I would love to try to use y'all's uh, uh, online profile resource place that has messaging um, abilities. What is that called? I signed up for it when we were talking. Uh, are, is it Handshake or is it? Yeah, I think that's what it is. Let me look real quick. Um, Roadrunner Network. Okay, okay, great, yeah. Um, so for those of you who are not on Roadrunner Network, um, it's it's fairly new and it's essentially, um, it's pretty simi similar to LinkedIn, but specifically like for UTSA alumni and um, just industry connected folks and, and students at UTSA. So um, it's a good way to get connected with um, potential mentors and people who are in the field that you're interested in and just um, kind of making those connections that way. Um, so um, encourage you to, to look that up. It's just called Roadrunner Network and you can find it on the UTSA website. Um, you, can also, you can also contact me for any follow-up questions. Um, I'm going to put my email. You probably see my email all the time from all the messages I send out, but um, just in case um, yeah, thank you all so much for coming. Um, we were able to record this session and it's going to be on our YouTube account as well, um, in case people want to go back to it. And yeah, um, Zachary, thank you so much for your time. This was great. We really appreciate it. No, it was, it was a pleasure. Thank you all. <laughs> See ya. Okay, everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.